and hello and let's get back out of this that and would be the old one maybe I don't know I <sighs> thought I deleted it somehow we had it where it was um, horizontal but we have forgotten how to do it so hey Mickey um, I guess you're seeing us sideways, right? So if I turn my head like this. Are we showing up with the video sideways or straight up and down? Good afternoon, Roberta. Hey, Audrey. I know y'all don't like just looking at dead space, so I'm going to move this back over here. We thought we had it fixed last week um, where we were doing... Okay. Ah, so it is. Okay, so we're good. Hey, Courtney. Yay. As much as we love snuggling, it's nice to not have to like... Uh. <laughs> so I'm tickled that's working. Hey, Marianne. Love you guys. And... Hopefully, Paul will have the comments up where we can see them, but we'll just see. Knows? Oh, good. I'm so glad. Courtney said it's perfect. perfect. Can't beat perfect. Perfect. Well, we have to put it on the wide screen because, you know, as we get older. We get wider. That's right. Let's see if we can do this right here. He's getting it all fixed. I don't know. How about that? Yay, Mickey said we're in full view. We're in full Excellent. View. About so. the only thing you can't see on the screen, at least the one I'm monitoring, is our notes in front of us. So here you go. Ready? Did you get it? That was your view of good, the notes. Good, good, good. Well, as y'all realize, we did not do Bible study last week, and I forgot to post that we wouldn't because... I did sneak my husband away for a trip. We went over to the coast, not the Gulf Coast, but the Atlantic Coast. We spent a few days on the beach, and then we went to Charleston, South Carolina, and we just had a wonderful, spontaneous trip. We don't ever do that. We always plan trips, reserve all the hotels, plan where we're going, even if we're just going to go sit on the beach, which Paul and I don't really, like, spend time on the beach except to walk and look for shells. And, but we like sitting on balconies, sitting, sipping coffee or tea. Or, and we love eating shrimps. <laughs> and crab legs and all kind of sea, yep. seafood. We and love we, that. And we love riding in the car together and being together. Yes, we do. Which so, we got a lot of time to do. And we loved it. It was wonderful. It was just what we needed. Um, anyway, so this week we're going back to where we were two weeks ago in Proverbs 31, verse 28. And everybody's writing and I'm not sure what they're... Hey, Haley! Yay! Hey, Isaac and Charlie and... Leah and Levi, and hopefully Aaron is going to be watching, and hello to all of them. Um, Polly and Ellie and Isaiah and <clears throat> Cora and Emma and Millie and little baby Hezekiah and little baby Charlotte and Aunt Haley's tummy. Everybody's just doing so great. <clears throat> um, so we are... Continuing on with our Proverbs 31, verse 28, which is, Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So, um, if you go back uh, and watch that Bible study again, we talked about every aspect of that as far as who your children are, um, not necessarily children that were birthed from your own body. Um, 
what is the truth of standing uh, for godliness? Um, what it really is to be called blessed. I'm trying to just go back over and about training up the child in the way he should go. We talked about um, what it means to be worthy to be praised. Um, we give all of our the glory to the Lord. Everything is glory to the Lord. But in order for us to have any acknowledgement of doing right, we have to follow the pattern that God set before us. And so I went over a lot of scripture um, about showing love in every aspect, godly functioning, love in spite of. Um, and then we got down to Ephesians chapter 5, and that's where we kind of stopped um, on this verse. And I know it seems kind of silly to do a study of a certain verse and then have to go to another book and do a whole chapter to, pertaining to that one verse. But that's what Bible study is. It's um, studying the Word of God, trying to find the truth. And, and I have to tell y'all, the older I get, the more I realize how much I have missed, how much I have failed, how far I am from where I thought I would be at this point in my walk. Um, because the light becomes lighter and it shows up all of the dark spaces even more. Mm -hmm. Where you thought you had conquered something and you, you take one step, you realize the light is beaming on this massive amount that you haven't conquered. Yeah. And so every morning when I wake up, I thank the Lord for what I have been able to do. But I also am very keenly aware of where I have not conquered. And um, if anybody tells you they have conquered flesh, back up. Because there's always something else we need to conquer. There's always one more plateau we need to ascend to. Because... As long as we breathe, we're going to be working out our salvation in fear and trembling. Yep. Don't you agree? I do. So today we are still on verse 28 of Proverbs 31, but we are <clears throat> going to spend our time today on Ephesians chapter 5. And I have to tell you, we're only going to get halfway through it. Um, I've spent hours looking, looking, searching scripture, looking at even commentaries, which y'all know I don't love um, footnotes and all. I love to get straight from the Holy Spirit, but there's so much meat in Ephesians chapter 5. And this again is pertaining to how we become worthy to be called blessed and how we become worthy of our husbands praising us and um, I hope I covered that sufficiently leading up to this. Do you think I've covered that properly? You did. You did. It, it is um, probably a disconnect because of being two weeks ago that this was covered. But um, hopefully you can jump back in. And if you missed that two weeks ago, it's already out on YouTube. Yes. So. Um, and if you didn't see Paul's message from Sunday, we were hooting and hollering at the blessing that that was for all of us. It was just straight from the Lord, and Sunday's God, message. God gave it to me while we was on the beach, too. I was sitting there watching the sunrise with a bunch of other people we didn't know, and that passage came to me. I remember. Yeah. I, remember. I, mean, I, I started crying because of the way the Holy Spirit speaks to you and where he speaks to you. It's amazing. Oh, well, yeah, if you listen. It's amazing. So Ephesians um, chapter 5. <clears throat> Um, honey, we're just going to, we're going to literally stop at almost every verse. So if you can just read our Ephesians part, just first verse. First verse. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Be ye therefore. So the phrase or the word therefore means something preceded that. Be ye therefore. That's after the fact. So we're going to back up and we're going to go to Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Therefore means for that reason, or consequently, as a result of, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, we forgive because we have been forgiven. Um, in the last four months, it has been uh, exercise in forgiveness um, for us. We have, we have delved into every aspect of forgiveness. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. At, I mean, it's just been a continual daily process of examining forgiveness. We want to forgive all trespasses we want because we want to be forgiven. And if you study out what is forgiveness, you know, there's all the things that all the pastors always preach. We look at how Jesus' life exhibited forgiveness. Um, we look at how God designed forgiveness to be. And all of those things can be very different than what one person individual says is forgiveness. And um, I encourage you, if you've never done a study on forgiveness, that you do that. I'm not going to take the time here to do that except this little bit. Um, to forgive, in the definition of that, to cease to feel resentment against. To cease to feel resentment against. To grant pardon for or remission of an offense or a debt to absolve. Have you ever had a debt forgiven? We had a car one time we were buying. Years and years ago, it was one of those K cars. You remember the K cars? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, it was like every penny we had, we were just in a really bad financial time and we were having to make payments on this car. And literally things were falling off of this car um the engine was not functioning the window the front passenger window broke and it we could not replace it and literally had to put a sheet of plastic y'all would have y'all would have died laughing if you'd seen this thing coming down the road no air conditioner i don't think there was any heat in it i mean it was literally it should have gone to the junkyard but we were still having to pay for this car i think one of the doors fell off too the door it was terrible this was uh, obviously it was the a last lemon. chrysler product i would ever want to own yeah it was a lemon but anyway so the time time came i couldn't pay for this car i had no money and literally drove it back to the used car lot to return the car because we, we had no money. We were so broke, so poor. And the man that owned the place, I think we had maybe three more payments to make before we had paid the car off. And he drove up and said, you know, I'm sorry. I have no money to pay you. I'm just bringing you back the car. And he looked at the car and he walked around the car. He said, just take it back home because it's not worth anything. It's shot. And he forgave the debt. He forgave what was owing. And I've always remembered that, that even though I may bring a weak, worthless effort, God can still forgive that debt. And of course, Jesus paid the debt in full, but you know what I'm saying. There are times when you just feel the burden and the weight and I come back to the Lord and I say, Father, forgive me. I don't know how y'all are. You may believe that you only have to say it one time at the altar when you're crying and really upset. And you never have to ask forgiveness again. I don't believe that. I ask forgiveness every day, sometimes 20 times a day. Mm. I, won't, I walk in a plea of forgiveness. And um, so I always think about that um, <coughs> forgiving the debt. There may not be anything worth having out of it, but I want to be forgiven of that. Was that totally wrong? I mean, did I did that make sense? I think so. I mean, okay. I haven't seen anybody asking questions, so. Uh, followers, where it says, Be ye therefore followers of God, 
Followers means imitators, a person who copies the behavior or actions of another. You cannot be a follower of the Lord if you are not striving to imitate and be what the Lord is. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, everybody everywhere now is be kind, be, you know, be forgiving, don't judge, don't do this, don't do that. Examine the scripture, ladies. We've got to be imitating the Lord. Part of the problem we have now in this nation is because we allowed standards to go by the wayside so we wouldn't offend people. Um, but I want to be a follower of God. I want to do it the way the Lord does it. Again, I fail a thousand times, but I still keep trying. God is love, and those that dwell that dwell in love, dwell in God and God in them. Thus he has proclaimed his name, gracious and merciful and abundant in goodness. I love that quote. Um, so now we are in 1 John 4, 16. And Paul's typing, so I will read it. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. I did a Bible study probably a year or two back that was, what is love? What is love? Right now, a lot of people that have raised chickens are incubating chickens and chicks and eggs and, you know, growing their flock. Mm -hmm. And we learn a lot from hatching eggs. Um, and of course, y'all have heard this story a thousand times. When you have a chick that is hatching, if it's pipped and made a little crack in the shell and for some reason just cannot get out of that shell, maybe it's almost completely out, but still not quite out, the temptation is to be sweet and kind and loving and help that little baby because it's just struggling so hard and I don't want that little baby to die, so I'm gonna help it. Well, when you do that, that baby, you may can get it out of the shell. And it is extremely rare if that baby makes it more than a week. Sometimes it'll do great for a day or two, but then after just a short time, they don't survive. And you think it's all gonna be great. And um, that's something to think about. Struggle makes us strong. Struggle makes us strong. And not struggle because you're going against God. Right. You taught a thing one time about the wrong, right thing. It seems right to do this, but in fact, you're doing the wrong, right thing. Yeah. Somebody just wrote a long comment. My great-grandson Peyton is joining us today. He heard you saying hi to all your grandbabies. Hi, Peyton. How are you, sweetie? I hope you're doing good today. How's things at Peyton's place? At Peyton's, <laughs> Peyton's place. Um, as dear children, where it says, be you fo therefore followers of God as dear children. Children are obliged to imitate their parents in what is good, especially when dearly beloved by them. The character that we bear of God's children obliges us to resemble him, especially in his love and goodness, his mercy and readiness to forgive. As dear children, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, beloved. And we've said this many times. Being a child of God is, should not be based on our fear of hell. It should be based on our love for God. And when we examine the word of the Lord and we examine the pattern of Jesus Christ, you know, a lot of people discount the entire Old Testament because they say That's, that God's not nice. He's mean. He condemns people and banishes them and, you know, their children die and he tells them to, massacre all the children, all the animals, everything of the enemy. That's not a loving God, people say. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. It is a very loving God. Yeah, if you look at how long God put up with their sin and gave them years and years of warning before judgment came, if you look at that, and the New Testament is no different if you look at uh, 
Ananias and Sapphira, judgment came on them. You know? Yes. Um, Judas, Judas walked three years with Jesus, and he had every opportunity to get his heart right. And, you know, I talk to the girls every day. I've already raised my children. I don't have little bitty ones anymore, but, you know, our children are raising children, and... Um, and, you know, I may talk to one of them. I say, well, what y'all doing today? And one of them will say, well, I'm trying really hard not to just whip the kids. And I say, well, what's going on? Well, I've told them 20 times to clean up their bedroom, and they just keep wasting time and won't get it done. And, again, I'm, I, all of this is going back to Proverbs 31, 28, where her husband praises her, praising her because she has <coughs> walked worthy of that honor. As a wife and a mother, as a sister, as a daughter, as a servant of Jesus Christ, there are certain things that we are called to do. And one of them is to walk as imitators of our Lord, doing as the Lord would do. As a parent, you, you teach your children. And sometimes that requires discipline. And you know, you don't go overboard. That's abuse. But there's a time for discipline when things are not being done properly. And you hopefully will discipline yourself. But little children don't do that. They just don't want to have to do anything. So realize that the discipline of the Lord seems harsh at times. And if the Lord is disciplining you in some way, the quicker you receive that discipline, the easier life can be. We discipline little children. We aren't called to, I'm not called to discipline my husband, but now I will tell you this, at times he's disciplined me. He doesn't spank me. He doesn't send me to my room without my supper, but he sat me down and talked to me about things. And those are disciplines that I receive from because that's a godly kind of discipline, mm. right? Let's look at Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans have the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than the others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Imitators of our Lord, imitators of our God, followers of our God, we need to function in the same pattern that God is functioning. Yes, it is very hard. We have to put our flesh down. And before this is over, I'm going to talk about that. But sonship, another quote that I found, sonship infers an absolute necessity of imitation. It being vain to assume the title of a son without the similitude of the father. It's taking the Lord's name in vain if we don't function as the Lord functions. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. Have you ever been despitefully used? Have you ever been cursed by someone? Have you ever had an enemy that just seemed to want to dishonor you, shame you, humiliate you? We don't lash back. <clears throat> We don't lash back. We leave that in the hands of God to deal with. Um, if there's someone in your life that has just become a thorn in your flesh, it's not of God for you to become a thorn in their flesh. Hmm. Now, at times, just you functioning is the thorn in their flesh. Just you living your day. Um just going about your business because you don't get riled, they get upset. To them, that's a persecution because you're not upset. But we're going to walk as the Lord. 
We're going to imitate Father God. We are going to walk in peace. We're going to walk in love. And, you know, it's great when people can write out scriptures. People aren't stupid. They know exactly how to present themselves. But you've got to do what's right in your heart. You've got to do what's right in the eyes of God. And I'm going to tell you, you may never be recognized. But if you have someone, your husband, some of you are not married anymore, you're widows, you're divorced, you're single, you never did marry, you know that the Lord is your husband. And if your husband is honoring you, whether it be a human husband or God, the Father, you know when you are walking right with the Lord. I have to say, we're talking about people that abuse you and use you and persecute you. A lot of times in your mind you think, but that person needs to be judged. That, per you know, that needs to be stopped what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely God's place to stop them. That's right. It is, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And, and I, that hit me one time years ago when God reminded me that if I take vengeance on someone, even if it's deserved, he can't do it. He can't have his part. Oh, that's, yeah. It's like, well, you already punished them, so I'm not that's going. That's right. So I, I, you've taken it from my hands and you've punished them. That's right. You've taken it, my job, and you've done it yourself at a lesser level and, it, and not the way it should have been done. And it occurred to me that God is so much better at correcting people than me. Amen. Than I. That, you know, he, he really does what is just and fair. And a lot of times I get in the flesh, and even though I might be doing the will of the Lord, so to speak, and I'm not doing what he wants, doing what he wants done, but he's the one that's supposed to do it. Amen. That's really, that's so really So when good. I did that, I began to back away, follow these passages, look at people that, you know, had judgment coming, and then began to feel sorry for them because I knew judgment's coming for you. Yes. You're a spiritual train wreck happening, and I can't help you. I can't stop you. I can't punish you because God is going to. But I could see it coming clearly, and when it did happen, it was terrible. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. And that's the attitude we're supposed to have. That's right. That's right. That's being a follower of him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. We follow scripture. We follow scripture teaching, but we also follow the pattern of godliness we have seen in the lives of others. Um, that's one reason it's so important to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together so that you can speak those exhortations and words of encouragement and receive them from others. Because, you know... I joke about this all the time, wanting to hermitize and just be in our own little container and just leave us alone and we're just going to be here and, and grow our food and deal with our chickens and we're just happy right here. But to, to have that collective environment of others who are walking this walk, who are striving for the Lord, um, it's the scripture in, in daily life. To see the experiences of others. That's why I think people love Bible studies like this with others. Because they want to hear this person's viewpoint. <coughs> and um, it's just so valuable. Yes. It really is valuable. And we appreciate your comments. Um, we hopefully don't miss any of them. We go back after the broadcast. And um, yeah, that was, just a, that was just a heart floating up. I know. But that's, I mean, that's why I tell you all the time, please comment. I know I get sort of to where I'm on a roll and you don't want to miss something I've said, but, but we really do. Your comments, your, your insights mean so much to us. Um, Ephesians 5, 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So we've spent 30 minutes on verse 1. I tend to do that. I apologize if that's frustrating. But um, we are in a love walk, 
a love walk. We are not in the world's idea of what love is. We are not in the flesh idea of what love is. We are in the walk that God said is love. Um, I used to, it was sort of a joke when I was raising the kids and we were raising the kids and, you know, there's two kinds of people. Well, there's like a thousand two kinds. There's lazy people. There's people that work hard. There's aggressive people. There's calm people. There's people who strive for what is right and people who just fly by the seat of their pants and whatever happens, they figure it out then. And there are people who think things out and people who don't. And I used to tell the girls, are you a thinker or are you, I won't say what I said. Well, what I said was, are you foolish? Are you a thinker or are you foolish? A thinker stops and ponders and I believe that's scriptural, to meditate on the Word of God. Meditate on the things of God. Are you a thinker? Do you put your thoughts into what the Word of God is saying? Or do you just absorb like a sponge everything that everybody's saying and then just kind of deal with it as you go? I'm a thinker. I say, Lord, what, what do you want me to see here, Father? What do you want me to learn from this? How am I supposed to step the next step? What am I supposed to do? How do I go back and fix whatever I didn't do right the first time? I, I think about things because I really don't want to make a mistake. I believe you. And yet I do it all the time. In the walk in love, we have to really seek God about what that love looks like in any given situation. Christ loved us with his whole being. His flesh did not matter. And if you spend time thinking about how little the flesh mattered to Jesus Christ, it will change your perspective. He fasted for 40 days. No food. It didn't say he just fasted coffee or chocolate. He fasted. He didn't eat anything. Do you think he, well, do you think he drank? Drank water? I don't know. He, I don't know. He could have, supernaturally, he could have just done away with everything. I mean, physically, you can't go 40 days without water, but you, supernaturally, he could have done it. He walked on water, so he... He walked on water, yeah. yeah. He hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice of God. I would venture to say that probably 98% of any given day is focused on that flesh. Yeah. And even, even a person that's walking with the Lord, you're, you're dealing with the things that the flesh is requiring. And when you add on top of that the carnal desires of the flesh, it leaves very little time to focus on the Spirit. You know, one time I got really sick. It, I ended up... I had to have stress tests, heart cath. I had all this stuff. Was in the hospital for days. Um, it was really we. Even any pictures that were taken during that time were titled "Mama's Crisis." It was terrible. I honestly didn't know if I would survive. Every moment was either in prayer or trying to stay alive. That's the way I felt. Paul was sleeping in a chair in a hospital because I, it was a struggle for life and death. When the doctor comes in there and, and you say, is there any other medicine you can give me? And he said, we're giving you everything there is. 
and it's not working. That's scary. It was a scary, scary time. My flesh was strong and part of what, I mean, my spirit was strong and you spoke about that Sunday for church when you're at your weakest physically. Your flesh is, I mean, your spirit is fighting and that, and my spirit was fighting, but a huge, a huge amount of my waking moments was trying to keep my body alive. It was, it was very difficult. But when I came out of it, <coughs> me and the Lord were like this. We were tight. I trusted him. I needed him. And he was there. And so when we look, I've got a twitch in my eye again. When we think about this walk of love, it is a sacrificial walk. Our flesh doesn't matter. You eat unless you're fasting. You drink water. You try not to do foolish things with your body, but anything else that's given over to pleasing this flesh in a, in a carnal manner is a waste. It is a waste, and I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to read in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through... My hands are dry. 3. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring. Endeavoring means to exert oneself to give diligence. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ladies, you're not always going to be able to do that. It doesn't mean that you are a failure if you cannot keep peace. You are trying to walk in peace. You are endeavoring to keep the unity of peace, but sometimes that's not going to happen because the situation you may be in, the people you may be dealing with, whatever it may be, you may not have the same goal. Think about the life of Christ here. Did Jesus walk in love? Of course. At every nanosecond, Jesus walked in love. Was Jesus in peace in his heart? Of course he was. But did everybody just think he was doing the right thing and just, you know, hey, here comes the man of God? No, no, a thousand times no. So was Jesus a failure in what he did in his ministry? Obviously not. Obviously not. But guess what? When he left this earth, there were more people that hated him than loved him. Am I right? Right. But did he strive to walk in peace? Did he endeavor to keep the unity of peace? Did he serve the Lord with Lord God with all of his being? Yes. But guess what? People were still mad. Ephesians 5 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints. But walk in love, endeavor to keep the unity. But, however, guess what? There's more to it. We are in a time like we have never been in in this country. And I know there are some ladies that watch that are not even in this country. They're in Europe. We have a lady that's in... Um, South Africa, I don't know how that works. I don't know if it's the middle of the night when she watches, I don't know. Maybe this isn't happening in your country, but in this country, we are at a threshold. There is such diversity of beliefs that we struggle to try to understand what's happening. And I'm talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm not talking about the lost. 
and the saved. Obviously, there's going to be disunity there. I'm talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. There is acceptance of things that should not be accepted. There is tolerance for things that should not be tolerated. It should not be once named among you. As becometh saints. Now I looked it up. A saint is a most holy thing, sacred and consecrated. We are not Catholics. We're not Roman Catholics. We don't pray to saints. That's not something we believe in. And so we're not talking about designated saints in that way. But all who are born again, who are walking with the Lord, who have sold their life out to Jesus Christ and, and made him Lord of their life, you are consecrated. You are sacred. And if you are consecrated and sacred and sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ and born again, you are called to not tolerate open sin amongst believers. That doesn't mean you have to go out there and point your finger in people's faces and call out their sin. You don't, That's not what you're supposed to do. Now, maybe at some point in your walk, maybe the Lord would have you do that privately with someone. I, what is it, Matthew chapter 5 or chapter 25, church discipline? Five, I think. Five. It talks about how you do that. But you don't, you don't rent billboards and people put people's name on there. Even Jesus wrote in the sand and, and the people went away one at a time. And Paul's always believed that when he was writing in the sand, he was writing their sins. And the people that were looking over ready to cast those stones were seeing their sins written out in the sand. There's a way to address sin. But we are never to tolerate sin. We shouldn't even be gossiping about it behind people's back. That's what that means. Let it not be once named among you. Fornication, the actual uh, Aram, or Hebrew word is pornea, which we obviously see pornography in. Illicit sexual intercourse. Any sexual activity outside of a godly marriage between a man and a woman is uh, a husband and a wife is fornication. Whether you're a teenager or you're a 30-year-old or a 90-year-old, if you are having sexual relations outside of the marriage of you to your spouse in the eyes of God, you are committing fornication. Stop it. Don't smile at it. Don't wink at it. Don't say, oh, that's just the way people are nowadays. They don't even think twice about it. You best be thinking twice about it. Because when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are, the curse of sin is removed from you. You are no longer a slave to sin. So if you're still willfully sinning, you're being conformed to this world. That's right. Instead of being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And let me tell you something. Just a little side note here. You're not anybody's friend if you're standing by knowing that's going on and just patting them on the back, telling them you love them. Yep. Kids will be kids. And adults will be adults. Uncleanness, the impurity of lustful, luxurious, or profligate living luxurious, profligate. When we went down to Florida this past weekend, because we did not reserve hotel rooms and were just being spontaneous, the first night we were literally going to be sleeping in a car because we were not going to spend $350 on a hotel room. Nope. And we ended up in two, two nights in a hotel room that I was just praying there was no bugs in it. I just, I mean, to be completely honest, because we had not reserved anything. Profligate 
and luxurious and exorbitant living is when you're doing this massive amount of things to please your flesh, to please the carnal nature. Romans 1, 24 and 25 That, hit that again. Janet. I know, Janet. It is hard. It is hard. Uh, Romans 1, 24 through 25. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. No one wants to be corrected when they feel like what they're doing is not hurting anybody but themselves. They say that all the time. Don't. I'm not hurting anybody. I'll deal with God. Yes, you will. But when you love someone, when you love someone with the love of the Lord, your heart should be to draw them back into the fold. Um, before you move on, I'm stuck on uncleanness being luxurious, profligate living. I'm, I saw that and I just, my brakes went on. It was like, that is really the modern church to look at. They, they tell you, you know, even the, the televangelist telling you that, well, Jesus was wealthy, right? He, you know, if he was alive today, he'd have a Cadillac. There's people that actually teach that. I know. And, you know, the times that we've gone out, we've, I mean, we have a nice, clean, comfortable home. It's not extravagant. By some standards, it might be. But we need the size home we have for the large family we have. Um, when we bought a vehicle recently, we didn't get a new one. I don't think we've ever bought a new vehicle. I've never had a new vehicle. Never. And um, the the profligate, luxurious living is uncleanness, and it's a sin. It is a sin. And yet they teach you, you know, in the modern church to just, or a lot of churches, I won't say every church, but they teach you um, to enjoy all you you have here because this is important to, to have a great life and do the best you can, get the top of the line, this and that. And um, it really... If, you're, if your heart is toward that, it really takes away from the things of God. And, you know, I'll say we have some beautiful things in our home, but I would venture to say 99% of everything we have in our home came from a thrift store or a, a, I say an antique store, but they're more like flea market. Junk shop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> junk shops. And really, We just time. don't spend large amounts of money. And all we, the stuff you see don't. behind us, every time someone comes here and they say, oh, that's a beautiful um, Whatever. teacup. And you says, thrift store, $2. She she always remembers that you got it for $2, got it for 50 cents. Yeah. Yard sale, right there. And then I give away half yeah. of the stuff I um, bring in. She's got a small collection of a set pink luster wear. Pink luster wear, Tasha Tudor. And she did not know that it was supposed to be valuable and she didn't pay a lot for it. And a yeah. friend of ours that told us that, it, oh, you've got a great collection of pink luster wear. We, did, we just thought it was nice and cute yeah. and stuff. And so it, we don't spend a lot of money on extravagant things. No. We buy things that we think are nice and things we want to leave our kids, but we don't go into a lot of trouble to buy extravagant things. Mm -mm. Top no. of the line. No. No, we just, profligate living is where you're focusing everything you have on what you want to gain and get more of and focus on that. And, that's, and that goes along with covetousness. So covetousness. I see, I was tying the two you together. Were, you're I was so not good. holding you up. No. Okay. I thought it was interesting. I apologize. My eye is twitching. I've got to go get new glasses. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. Isn't that an interesting grouping? I thought it was. Covetousness. Pleonexia, greedy desire for more. Avarice, greed, covetous. As I studied, and again, 
we're on what? Verse 3. All of these things are to serve the flesh desire. To serve the flesh desire. And the more we serve the desires of the flesh, the greater our appetite increases for those things. It's just incredible how much it increases and how quickly. We went to the Charleston Tea Plantation and I shared some pictures on a group that I'm on. And I was looking at the pictures that I didn't share and they have a wonderful little gift shop and all these beautiful things and these, you know, beautiful porcelain teapots and all of this stuff. And I was looking around and, and because I'm a thrift store shopper, you know, I, I immediately, the first thing I look at is the price and I'm looking at things and flipping the price over. And Paul comes up behind me and puts his arms around me. He says, you get whatever you want. As sweet, wonderful as that was, that was not what I needed to hear at that moment because I wanted everything because it was all so beautiful. And I love tea and I love tea parties. You know, the grandbabies come and we have tea parties and it's so sweet. Well, my, my mind, it was six hours away. We're not gonna run back over here. You're right. To pick up a tea pitcher that, a teapot that you liked, that you thought about all the way home. Just get what you want. So what we ended up with was gifts for the girls and gifts for the grandbabies. And I didn't come home with a new teapot. I did come home with a new teacup and some tea. And it was wonderful. And I was so excited. Me and Paul got a matching teacup and a little spoon. And then I got one extra, which he just knew I needed to have. But... You know, you get into those things, and I think those home shows and the Christmas shows that they have at the big civic centers, <laughs> I just, I, I don't go. And I'll tell you where I do struggle is at plant nurseries. When I go into a plant nursery, I see all of these plants, and I just want one of everything. It's a struggle. Your flesh likes what it likes. It wants what it wants. And we have to control that. We have to realize what matters in the eternal. Um, so I'm taking this from the filth of fornication all the way down to coveting a teapot. You've got to get your flesh under control, ladies. And I'm not addressing this at anybody. I'm When I look at this, I see Angie's right there and Paul's right there. So when I'm talking, I'm looking at my face and reminding myself, control this flesh. And it all has to, goes back to, and her husband will call her blessed, right? Yes, her children will call her blessed because she's teaching properly. And right. her husband will praise her because she's walking worthy of the Lord. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to tell everybody that you really are that way. You really... Um, it doesn't matter, you know, how nice something looks in this house. Like you say, it was bought from a thrift store um, or someone gave it to you. Controlling, controlling the urge and the lust yeah. of the flesh. Don't, don't live past your means. Yeah. Verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now, I have to tell you. This is a confession about the jesting and foolish talking. We do get silly around here. We get really silly in our family, and we, we do like to joke around and be silly. And, and I think there is truly a level there that your spirit has to show you which part is right and which part is not. But filthiness is obscenity of the portrayal or description of sexual matters, offensive or disgusting by accepted standards of morality and decency. This is one of those evolutionary terms because what is acceptable now in our society was never acceptable when I was a kid. And what was acceptable when I was a kid was not acceptable when my grandparents were children. It is evolutionary 
the tattoos, the piercings. If you have a tattoo and you got that before you became born again, please don't take offense. If you're still getting tattoos, stop it. Stop. Just stop. Um, but I'm shocked. I'm truly, deeply shocked at what is just part of normal conversation now. Just people don't even think about it. You know, when I was little, they didn't say pregnant mm. on television. Mm. And now, I guess, they say they show you how to get pregnant on television now. It's just foul. I, I'm just shocked. And I, I, I very much take the seriousness behind the pulpit because um, this right here, I mean, there's so many pastors that want to bring a joke in. They actually, their focus the week, every week is the joke that you're going to go home with. Mm -hmm. And if all you get out of your pastor's sermon is, the only thing you can remember is Monday morning, you can remember that joke he told. And I know that's actually taught now in some seminaries is always have a clean joke to tell. Well, why do you even have to have a joke? Sometimes humor comes out of the gospel. I've had times when I've read things and it just is like some of the passages in the Bible, they just make you smile. Mm -hmm. But when you intentionally look up a joke to make a point every week, you're not, you're doing a disservice to your flock. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you take the, the pulpit as in seriousness. Yes. Just like us. I mean, you have... I don't see any, any jokes on here. You didn't prepare any jokes ahead of time. No humorous stories. And that's the way the, the scripture is to be taken. That's right. I know there's even a, um, a lot of people that have never thought about uh, Veggie Tales, the cartoon, being improper because we're animating and making um, comical characters to teach the gospel. And then I'm not going to, I'm not going to just, talk about that too much but we really need to think is it really proper is it something that we leave kids with do they have a seriousness of the gospel um ken ham that does answers in genesis he doesn't like the idea of people doing cartoon noah's arcs i don't either because it is absolutely teaching children this was a wonderful time you know well, how how sweet it was for noah the zookeeper to get all these animals the judgment side is left off of that and it was a sad time. Yes. So that's that's what I mm -hmm. that's what I th think when I see this is the foolish talking, filthiness, jesting is not the things that come naturally, but preparing ahead of time during a Bible study or message, your big joke. Yes. Yes. And foolish talking is buffoonery, impious, godless conversation. Um, jesting, insulting, libelous, scandalous, coarse, irreverent, and the word low jesting was in there. Just being coarse and foul and rude. and That should not be part of the walk of a Christian. And like I said, we do, we do a lot of joking around in our family, a lot of sarcasm, and that's something we need to work on. We need to, but it's not hurtful. We just, you know, playing around. And that's something we need to work on. Of course, we do a lot of serious talk about the Lord, too. Um, verse 5. I know we've got to. Verse 5. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Go ahead. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these, think, these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Vain words are empty, fruitless, and devoid of truth. We see a lot on Facebook, which we're trying to wean ourselves off of greatly, of these cutesy little statements, cutesy little um, pictures with cutesy little quotes on there. And that's all they are, cutesy. It's like wax fruit sitting in a fruit bowl on the table. And some child runs in to grab that beautiful pear and starts to bite and realizes it's artificial. We don't, we don't need cutesy. We need real. We need real. 
verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Were darkness. You notice it doesn't say were in darkness. Were darkness. For ye were sometimes darkness to the point there was no light coming out. Do you ever remember a time in your walk where you were actually darkness? I do. I was not only not reflecting any light, I had no light in me. And when you, when you realize that you are darkness, your spirit becomes suffocated. And, it, and even when it gets to just a still, small voice, the Holy Spirit wooing you to come toward the light. Yeah, it's cliche, but it's true. You were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Again, let me go back. Let me go back to 30 minutes ago. When you are born again, ladies, when you are born again, you, the, you no, are no longer a slave to sin. The words, I couldn't help it, the devil made me do it, are no longer pertinent in your life. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are now, that is broken in you. You are now a child of light. If there is a prevailing sin, if you're a gossip, if you're a, a fornicator, if you are hate-filled, if you walk in anger, if you walk in depression, and I'm not talking about the chemical kind of depression that that the human body over time has become off kilter chemically. There's two different kinds of depression. If you are walking in any kind of sin perpetually and you're not breaking free, then you need to ask yourself, are you born again? Are you born again? Is there a person pervasive hereditary curse and I do believe in hereditary curses I really do is there something in your life that has been like passed on from generation to generation and you feel like you can't break free from and so you just walk in that well verse 5 says know this that no whoremonger nor unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. No inheritance. No I, inheritance. I thought if I just called myself a Christian, I would get to heaven. And if you say all the scriptures and you do all the things, yeah. it doesn't work that way. And it's not about somebody judging or somebody not forgiving. You know, and, and we say, uh, when you stand before the throne of God, there's two responses. Jesus or not Jesus. God knows the truth. An expert he is. You were in darkness. Clearly, we are to be the light. Imitators of our God. Remember what I read at the first verse. Followers means imitators. Walk, make progress, live regulate one's life. I asked Paul earlier, what does a regulator do? He's in electronics. He knows all of this stuff. So you tell us what a, a regulator, if you're going to regulate something. Well, you can have a regulator in electricity. You can have it in water. You can have it in gas pressure. You, a regulator controls to one pressure or voltage or whatever you're trying to level. It, it, it controls it. Or a, a legal re regulator like a um, government regulator would obviously control something from a law standpoint. So a regulator in general is something that maintains something at a level. Maintaining at a level. Neither high nor low. If you have a, a water pipe and a flow of water, you have a regulator in there that, that determines to the force something is happening. 
We had a water pipe under our house that kept blowing the pipe, and I don't know how it all worked, but Paul had to put on a regulator or something so that it would not have so much pressure that it would blow the pipe out. So, where it says, ye are li now ye are light, walk as children of light. Regulate yourself as children of light. Control yourself, and we do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. We control our walk. We should no longer be at the mercy of our flesh. We should no longer be at the mercy of that carnal thing that is within us that's pulling us to that sin nature. If we are, we are still slaves to sin, and that means that we never had that born-again life-changing, life-altering understanding with the Lord. It's not for me to say about someone else's life, but I can clearly see in someone else's life whether or not they are functioning or whether or not they are caving continually to a walk of sin. You can see it. You're not, you're not blind. We're not blind. That's, you know, one thing I, about me and Paul. When we have Bible study, and we, I've had this Bible study, is it almost four years? Now? Oh, my goodness, almost four years now. We've done home church online for well over 10 years. Yeah. Probably closer to 15. Well, concluding our website nearly 20 years, we did... Um, on our website years ago that we had, we, we did a message each week and I typed it up. And um, so it was out there in text form. So my point is pretty much everything about our life is laid bare. We are as, as open as a book. This is what you get, you know? So when you walk in light, it is revealed. It is revealed. That's the whole point of calling it light. And I know I need to stop because I'm almost 15 minutes over. But um, the next part, verse 9, we're going we're gonna to go through that. And I didn't get to get to the diamond You yet. know what? I think you've got so much more to share. She shared some of this with me. And this is not a, not a uh, bait to get you to come back. The, the heart and the meat of her, of her uh, section here is for next week and... It's really deep. She shared some of it right before the study, um, and I was I was really impressed that what God gave her. It really is amazing when you study in the Word, even passages you've seen before, and the Holy Spirit gives you one word or one thought to go on. And she did that, and it just blew my mind. Well, it did mine too because I had never thought when I was doing it where he was leading on this certain issue. And so we will continue on next week with Ephesians chapter five. Again, this is all pertaining back to Proverbs 31 verse 28. How, how do you become praised by your husband or your children to call you blessed? It's walking worthy of that calling. It's living your life above reproach. Not again, you know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Amen. So so while you may be bashed, you may be accused, you may be um, slandered or whatever, you walk worthy. And only you know whether you're walking worthy of the Lord. Mm. Okay? So we'll stop right there. And I can't wait to go back and see the comments because I know I've missed a bunch. Um, and before we close, I've been noticing on the iPad I'm watching on, that the video jerks and it's like it steps back and then it goes through and steps back. Um, is anybody else seeing that this week? Just I saw that too. Comment. It's like twitchy. It's like that Bujah day, you know, where you, <laughs> Bujah day is where I've never been there before. Yeah. Ephesians 5 is dog eared and Marianne's. Bible. That's oh, good. Oh, wow. It is really good. Mickey, I know. You've been with me a, a long time, girlfriend. Oh, that's good. Janet said, people will say, people say, well, don't judge. My reply is God has already judged in the scriptures what is right and what is not. It is clear. 
Amen. When they say don't judge, they're judging you. That's right. They're all, they're making a judgment. Yes, Shauna said cutesy is empty fluff. Yes. Ah. Uh, well, Audrey, Audrey asked something minute. to repeat it, but we don't know what it was. She said about the flesh and the appetites. What I was saying was, when we give over to the cravings of our flesh, whether it's fornication whether it's gossip, whether it's um, all these ex extraneous, unneeded activities, um, eating too much, whatever it is, we build more of an appetite. The more we give into it, the more of an appetite we've got. You know, I remember years ago, you remember Ted Bundy, mm -hmm. the serial killer? Mm -hmm. And I think it was James Dobson he allowed to do an interview before he was executed. And James Dobson asked Ted Bundy, this mass murderer, serial killer, where did this start? And he said it started with pornography. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit found a magazine in some bathroom somewhere and started looking at pornography and then and then a little pornography was not enough. He went to worse pornography and it built and built and built until he had such unspeakable imaginings. He ended up being a serial killer of these young women. Horrible, horrible things. It never, and, and what is that quote? Sin will lead you further than you ever expected to go. Yeah. You know the one I'm talking mm -hmm. about? And it's true. Cost you more than you want to pay. Yes. And it's it's not just reading romance novels that get a little bit dirty. It's and you know, people think, well, there's nothing wrong with reading all these romance novels. If you read romance novels, be careful because it makes you discontented with your life. It builds an appetite in you. And I told this one time too, when I was young, young married twenties and I was cleaning house, I didn't have any money, didn't have anything to do, couldn't go anywhere. I started watching soap operas. I realized after about six months of watching soap operas that I was becoming angry. I was becoming angry because my house was not beautiful. My husband was not devastatingly handsome and and all of, you know, people in soap operas never have to wash dishes or clean toilets or change diapers. They're always beautiful. They always are fixed up. They always get to go places and do things and their problems are generally solved in 30 minutes. That's not life. So when you feed yourself on these things, no matter what they are, they create a desire for more. And let me tell you something, Facebook, all the social media, that telephone is a gossip magnet. That's what that all is, is gossip magnet. Listening to everybody's business, talking on the phone, nonstop. Truth is, you can say what you need to say in less than five minutes and get off that phone because it creates that hunger for more. I want to know more. I want to know more. I want to see more. I want to feel more. That's what I was talking about, appetites. Audrey, okay, we love y'all. <laughs> I can keep going. I, I can keep going and going. And now I'm 20 minutes over. I, I love y'all. I have to say this new format does not let me sit close enough to you. So... When we close here, I'm going to have a little snuggle time with my wife. Because I missed out this week. Well, I'm going to share some pictures of our trip when okay. we get off of here. Because okay. it was wonderful. We love y'all. We will see you Sunday for home church if you're joining us for home church. Amen. And Tuesday for the next part of Ladies Bible Study. Have a blessed week.